we turn to the book of Nahum, Nahum chapter 1. It's found in your Bibles on page 1304. Read Nahum chapter 1. The book, Burden of Nineveh. The book of the vision of Nahum the Elkoshite. God is jealous, and the Lord revengeth. The Lord revengeth and is furious. The Lord will take vengeance on his adversaries, and he reserveth wrath for his enemies. The Lord is slow to anger and great in power, and he will not at all acquit the wicked. The Lord hath his way in the whirlwind and in the storm, and the clouds are the dust of his feet. He rebuketh the sea, and maketh it dry, and drieth up all the rivers. Bashan languisheth, and Carmel, and the flower of Lebanon languisheth. The mountains quake at him, and the hills melt, and the earth is burned at his presence, yea, the world and all that dwell therein. Who can stand before his indignation? And who can abide in the fierceness of his anger? His fury is poured out like fire, and the rocks are thrown down by him. The Lord is good, a stronghold in the day of trouble, and he knoweth them that trust in him. But with an overrunning flood, he will make an utter end of the place thereof and darkness shall pursue his enemies. What do ye imagine against the Lord? He will make an utter end. Affliction shall not rise up the second time. For while they be folded together as thorns, and while they are drunken as drunkards, they shall be devoured as a stubble fully dry. There is one come out of thee that imagineth evil against the Lord a wicked counselor. Thus saith the Lord, though they be quiet, and likewise many, yet thus shall they be cut down when he shall pass through. Though I have afflicted thee, I will afflict thee no more. For now will I break his yoke from off thee, and will burst thy bonds in sunder. And the Lord hath given a commandment concerning thee, that no more of thy name be sown. Out of the house of thy gods will I cut off the graven image and the molten image. I will make thy grave, for thou art vile. Behold upon the mountains the feet of him that bringeth good tidings, that publisheth peace. O Judah, keep thy solemn feasts, perform thy vows, for the wicked shall no more pass through thee. He is utterly cut off. We read that far. May God bless the reading of his word to our hearts. The rest of Nahum, chapters 2 and 3, continue that downfall of Nineveh and the punishment and destruction that will come upon her. We take as our text this, more, this evening the first seven verses of the chapter. We won't reread them. The first seven verses are our text for the sermon this evening. Beloved in our Lord Jesus Christ, the book of Nineveh is a complement to the book of Jonah. And it's a counterpart to the book. In Jonah, God sent the prophet to the city of Nineveh. God sent Jonah to Nineveh with a powerful message of repentance. And the fruit was that Nineveh repented. And God turned away his wrath. And Nineveh experienced a time of prosperity again. But now some hundred years are past. And the result now is... God's judgment as it comes through Nahum. Now throughout the Bible, we always see a close relationship between God's mercy and love and God's justice. God's anger and wrath against sin and sinners is an expression of His great love for Himself and for His holiness. And God's wrath then flows out of His love. God's mercy was seen in that repentance that came upon Nineveh under Jonah's preaching. Now, Nineveh has returned to violence. The Assyrians commit grievous sins. And now God's judgment comes upon Nineveh. There will be 
no mercy. Total destruction of the city. With the book of Nahum, we start the second half of the minor prophets. We have here the seventh of the twelve minor prophets. While we noted the prophets are not strictly chronological, we did note that the first six prophesied about a hundred years prior to the final six. And so now between Micah and Nahum, there are at least a hundred years. And now the prophecy takes place about 640 B.C., during the last days of Manasseh. For a hundred years there, there were no prophets and there was no message that came forth. But now, once again, God raises up prophets to continue His ministry and His word. Nineveh's fall is documented by historians as 612 B.C. So Nahum here is prophesying about 30 years before the downfall of Nineveh. Nothing is known about Nahum other than what's revealed here in this book. He must have been a very bold prophet in order to bring this message of scathing rebuke to the Assyrians. And he does so while they are yet in full strength. This was a burden, the burden of Nineveh. Anyone who has to confront in real life someone and bring a solemn message of judgment with regard to sin and destruction, will agree with Nahum. This is a burden to bear. No one desires to be the messenger of such horrible tidings. Nineveh was a great, a glorious city. We noted before, it had a great wall that ran all the way around the city that allowed for three chariots to be able to ride side by side on the top of that wall. It was powerful, and the city had executed an exercised its strength throughout the whole region. And now God comes and says, I'm going to destroy this city. The negative message. And yet the book contains encouragement and contains comfort from the word of God and from the prophet. Nahum's name means consolation or comfort. God's mercy and God's wrath are set side by side. And as we see God's mercy and God's wrath, God's destruction of Nineveh, but his preservation of his church. We're reminded of the wonder that took place at Calvary as we prepare to come to the Lord's table next week. We do so acknowledging that wrath of God against our sin, as well as the wondrous mercy of God in preserving to himself his church in Jesus Christ. And we acknowledge that our sins make ourselves worthy of that judgment that God speaks of here. It's only through the wonder of the cross that we are able to find that escape. We look at Nahum, the prophet of God's wrath, noting the judgment that he speaks here, the destruction that involves a total destruction of Nineveh, and finally the comfort. God is jealous, and the Lord revengeth. The Lord revengeth and is furious, we read in verse 2. Nahum begins his prophecy with an expression of God's attributes. And as he lays out these attributes of God, those two that are in the foreground are God's jealousy and God's vengeance. Now God's attributes are simply that which characterizes God. We can't speak of God in terms of physical attributes because God is a spirit. He doesn't have any kind of a physical characteristic. But we identify God through His spiritual attributes. And God's jealousy is that which flows out of His love for Himself and for His holiness. God loves Himself as the only God who is worthy of worship and praise. And that love for Himself results then in jealousy when anyone else is worshipped. We read repeatedly through the scriptures of that jealousy of God. For instance, the second commandment requires of us that we worship not just Jehovah God alone, but that we worship Him in the manner which He has commanded. And that we do so without making use of any images. God's jealousy repeatedly was provoked throughout the Old Testament when Israel would follow after other gods. And when they would make images then 
and they would serve and worship those images. God's jealousy was provoked as they followed after other gods and they gave them the credit for their material prosperity. They would enjoy the blessing of children and instead of thanking God, they would thank their idol gods. They would enjoy good crops and they would then express their gratitude and thanksgiving to the idols. God was moved with jealousy because Jehovah God alone is worthy of praise. He alone is worthy of thanksgiving and honor. God at times withheld material prosperity from Israel as she increasingly looked to idols and to other gods. And the idea there of withholding that was so that Israel would look at the other nations and the prosperity of the nations and would be able to experience her own jealousy and would be driven to see that it was her sin that had become the occasion for such consequences. Now that jealousy of God that the Bible speaks of again and again is a jealousy that consumes. It's a jealousy also that redeems. Because God is jealous for His own glory, He desires to bring some out of darkness into His glorious light. God also, out of jealousy for His own being, destroys the wicked and will bring about the destruction of those who sin unrepentantly. God's jealousy being the explanation behind the judgment, but also the salvation of others. God jealous for His own glory and displaying the greatness of His glory in the way of the judgment of sin and the vindication of those whom He saves in Christ. Now it's difficult for us to get our minds around at times how God can be a God of love and at the same time a God of such judgment and hatred. But it's important for us to realize that God's love and God's hatred are not conflicting emotions as they are with us. God's hatred flows out of His love. Because God loves Himself and because He loves what's right, Flowing out of that love is a hatred then for everything that stands contrary to God and His glory. God's love demands hatred. His love for what is right demands that sin be punished. And therefore, God's love for holiness and righteousness requires punishment for sin. If sin would not be punished, God would fail to be God. God's hatred flowing out of His love. It's in that context that the Bible speaks of our hatred being a godly hatred. When our hatred flows out of our love for God, then that hatred is a hatred that is pleasing in God's eyes. God here expresses His hatred, His wrath, with regard to his enemies. And he does so in connection with his jealousy. But we also find in this passage God's wrath and jealousy right alongside God's goodness, his mercy, and his long suffering. Remarkable, that is. The judgment that will come upon the wicked, and then we have in verse 7 the Lord is good, a stronghold in the day of trouble, and he knoweth them that trust in him. God will in no way clear the guilty. But then, He will also make atonement for those sinners whom He has chosen in Jesus Christ. We know that God did not have to choose anyone. He could have allowed the whole human race to be destroyed in His just judgment. But God in mercy chose to Himself a people whom He would bring out of darkness into light. And we have here that twofold working out of God's jealousy. On the one hand, consuming the sinner in wrath. On the other hand, redeeming the sinner in mercy. Giving an expression to how great our God is. And how Jehovah God, in His grace, is able to show to a people 
whom he has redeemed, his goodness and his mercy. In both cases, sin must be punished. And either that sin will be punished by everlasting destruction in hell or through Jesus Christ, who stands in the place and makes redemption for those whom the Father gave him. Through Jonah, God had showed his grace to a people chosen to him from eternity. Now in the way of their apostasy, God's consuming wrath would be evident. The generation that rose, that turned their back on Jehovah, was not a generation with whom he had determined to keep covenant. And now his consuming wrath would be evident in that he would bring about their destruction. Now what's striking about the book of Nahum in this passage is this. God's jealousy comes to expression in his vengeance. Vengeance is the idea of getting back. That receives the focus here in our text. Three times in verse 2, we have reference to God's vengeance. Now, God's vengeance is something that is unique to God. While there are ways that we can be moved to a godly jealousy and a godly hatred, we may never execute vengeance. The Bible again and again says, Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. I will repay. It's not our duty or calling to rise up in order to execute vengeance upon our adversaries. We allow Jehovah God to work that vengeance. And Jehovah God possesses a wrath that refuses to be quenched in any other way than in the way of perfect vengeance. He doesn't give in to his passions or compromise his ultimate goals. He's the master of his own wrath. And he's the one who executes and exercises that wrath in perfection. Now the greatest evidence of that, again, we see at the cross. At the cross of Jesus Christ, despite the awful crimes that are being conducted against Jesus by those wicked men around him, Pilate and Herod and the wicked Jews, Jehovah God heaps judgment vicariously on His Son. And God maintains perfect justice in the face of perfect love. Out of love for His children, He executes His judgment on His only beloved Son, through whom that vengeance, that justice, will be realized. With regard to the wicked, God pursues them unrelentingly in His wrath and anger and executes vengeance. And that's horrible for us to consider. While modern translations of the Bible try to get rid of the word hell, the reality is that Jehovah God teaches everlasting punishment for those who are unrepentant. And there is no ground in the Bible to teach that God loves or God desires the salvation of the unrepentant wicked who are not His elect. God desires the repentance of His elect, His children, but with regard to those who are reprobate, those whom He's not chosen, God gives them over to His vengeance. Now there may be a time when it seems as though they're free from punishment. But God remains God. And God hastens that judgment. And God brings about justice. Now that vengeance comes in God's time, according to God's good pleasure. God using also the wicked to accomplish the persecution of His church and the glory of His name. But God's anger and God's wrath come upon the wicked daily. There's no escaping from God's anger. And God's wrath consumes them until finally they are brought down to destruction in hell. God will not forgive one sin without that sin being paid for. And those who obstinately continue then in their sin have no hope of pardon apart from Christ. God will not forgive without repentance. The wicked try to argue and try to get away from that. 
And God's word here as he comes to Nineveh through Nahum is that Jehovah God is just. He is a God of vengeance. And he is a God who will not allow sin to go unpunished. He will bring about punishment. The wicked try to argue that they can find a way of escape. Perhaps God will look the other way. Perhaps Jehovah God is a God of love. He will have mercy. And as our Heidelberg Catechism in the opening Lord's Days explains all of the ways that wicked minds try to get around the judgment of God upon sin, we recognize how God's Word now comes through the prophet Nahum, demonstrating Jehovah God's just wrath and judgment. There is no way of escape. The only way of escape is through Jesus Christ alone. But there is no way of escape of man. Man cannot change God. Man cannot make atonement of himself. Man cannot find another, an angel or another creature to stand in his place. Jehovah God will bring about judgment. Nahum counters all those attempts to try to escape the wrath of God. There's no doubt God is a God of love and God is a God of mercy. But you cannot continue in the ways of sin and try to find comfort in the fact that Jehovah God is a God of love and mercy. God is armed with His own power. And Jehovah God will not allow any who continue unrepentantly in sin to escape. And that's a word of warning. As we examine ourselves this week, we take heed to that word of warning. We acknowledge our sin. We confess that sin. We cry out to God for mercy. We pray for the grace that God enable us to search our hearts in order that our sin be exposed and revealed so that we can turn from it and repent. Those who repent from their sins experience the marvelous mercy of God. Those who repent give evidence that they are found in Christ. And Jesus Christ took upon Himself the wrath that they served through His perfect sacrifice. And that's the marvelous working of God's goodness and God's grace in Jesus Christ. But Nahum now directs his word, especially to the Ninevites, the Assyrians. The Lord hath his way in the whirlwind and in the storm, and the clouds are the dust of his feet. Verse 3. What image should one who sins unrepentantly have of God? Nahum sets it forth here. He should consider the storm, consider the whirlwind, Consider the might and the majesty of that storm. These storms depict the activity of God as God descends from His lofty heights and as God reveals His power in the midst of this world. The whole atmosphere is disturbed by God through these storms. When God goes forth in His anger, the whole world is put to confusion. None can stand before the might and the vengeance, the wrath of Jehovah God. What do we see in the storm? The wind, the rain, the snow, the storm is such that it can transform in a moment lives of men and women. It can transform events in a moment. It can bring about destruction and devastation in just a moment. It can totally disrupt the plans that men have established. God in a moment is able to bring about complete devastation in order to demonstrate, be still and know that I am God. Now as we live in the midst of this world and as we see through the storm and through the creation the might and the majesty of God, we stand before Him in awe. The most secure thing in the midst of this world is probably the ground, the earth on which we stand. Often it's said after one flies somewhere, then he lands and he is sure glad to have his feet back on solid ground again. Well, what happens when the ground on which we stand, this earth, begins to surge? The mountains begin to quake. And that's what Nahum talks about here. I've never experienced a strong earthquake. But he speaks here of that earthquake begins to cause the whole earth to move and to surge. 
And I'm told it's among the most fearful of all natural disasters. That which you think is solid and that which you think is stable is now completely disrupted. And where can you go? There's nothing to hang on to. There's nowhere that you can escape to where you can find refuge. There's a feeling of utter hopelessness and helplessness. That is the expression of Jehovah's jealous wrath upon the wicked. His wrath and anger is directed toward sin and toward sinners as a just and righteous God who will punish those who walk and live in sin. The wonder of His grace is seen in the fact that He is pleased to look upon His own Son and to punish Him in the place of those whom He has chosen before the foundations of the world. The guilty must be punished, and that punishment will be severe. Beloved, this truth of judgment sets forth the necessity of the cross. As we prepare to come to the table of the Lord, we acknowledge the fact that Jehovah God is a God of jealousy and vengeance demands Calvary. The only possibility of escape, the only way by which you and I can enjoy the favor of God is in the way of judgment. And Jehovah God placed that judgment upon His own Son. Jesus Christ shed His blood and broke His body in order that we might know deliverance from the powers of sin. Benayim continues here with the destruction that will come upon this wicked city. With an overrunning flood, he will make an utter end of the place thereof, and darkness shall pursue his enemies. Verse 8. He goes on in the next chapters to describe with exquisite detail the judgment that's going to come upon this city and the way in which God will bring about its absolute devastation. And he explains why. He explains the wickedness of Nineveh, how the Assyrians executed their armies and sent forth their men in a way that was without any kind of mercy, absolute cruelty. Wickedly they conducted themselves. The specific target here then, the city of Nineveh and the destruction that God will bring upon them as complete destruction. As God zeroes in on the city, He does so setting forth the fierceness of His divine wrath that will come upon this city. And He exposes with detail their sin. He lays out, this is what you've done. You've conducted yourselves as drunkards. You've expressed yourselves as proud and all of the other sins exposed and how He will bring about that judgment very clearly and very decisively and He will do so as a total, complete judgment. That comes out especially here in the reference to darkness. Darkness in the Bible is a reference to terror. It's a reference to mourning. It can be a reference to perplexity, to dread. But when everything becomes dark, then a combination of all of those is one's experience. Where can one go? One doesn't even dare move, because to move will be to stumble and to fall. All the years that the Assyrians spent brutalizing other nations, oppressing them, will now culminate in absolute darkness coming upon them. God will see to it that their end will be complete. He repeats it again in verse 9. What do ye imagine against the Lord? You think you can stand before Jehovah God and live? He will make an utter end. Affliction shall not rise up the second time. There's not going to be any second chance. Judgment will come upon Nineveh. And God will annihilate Nineveh. Everyone was familiar with the massive resources that the Assyrian Empire had. In 2 Kings 19, verse 35, we read that the casualties of Sennacherib totaled 185,000 men after a single encounter with Jehovah outside the gates of the city. God killed 185,000 of their soldiers. And they still had many, many more soldiers. They were still fighting in multiple other wars. Now this sizable city is going to be mowed down like blades of grass. 
History confirms that the city did fall in A.D. 612, in B.C. 612. So some 30, 40 years after Nahum's prophecy. And it was so totally destroyed that one was not even able to find any remnant of the city left. For hundreds of years, people looked for where Nineveh had been located. They couldn't even find where Nineveh had been located. It was about 200 years ago, which would be 2,000 years after this prophecy, that finally archaeologists think that they may have located the remnants of this city. The judgment that God brought upon this city was dreadful, it was terrible, it was decisive. And Nahum is given now to prophesy of that judgment. It would be easier for the wicked if they were simply destroyed. But God will send them into everlasting destruction in hell. God knows the wicked in his wrath. And he will see to it that they are utterly destroyed from the earth and cast into everlasting damnation in hell. And that destruction will be realized in its finality when Jesus comes back again to raise up their bodies, reunite their bodies and souls, and usher all things into the end that he has determined. In setting forth the destruction of Nineveh, the prophet, by the inspiration of God, sets forth Nineveh here as a typical representation of the devil and all of the enemies of the church. This will be their end. Others are going to rise up after Nineveh from an earthly perspective, Babylon. Some are going to cause tremendous hardship again to the church of Jesus Christ. And ultimately the anti-Christian kingdom will rise up and will bring about judgment. But the people of God are to remember Nineveh and to lay hold upon the truth that Jehovah God, as a God of jealousy and a God of vengeance, will not allow the wicked to have the victory. He will bring about their end and their destruction. And all the future enemies of God are pictured here in Nineveh. God will not forget His people. The Assyrians have wreaked havoc on God's people. But Jehovah God will be the one to bring about vengeance. The Israelites are not to seek that vengeance. God will bring it about. And He will do so in a way that men could never realize. This judgment and this destruction upon the wicked is what is prophesied here in the book of Nineveh. And God does so in connection here with the Assyrians when they are at the height of glory. Assyria is a marvelous city. The nations around would have said, no one can bring about the destruction of this city. And yet Jehovah God would do so through the means that he had ordained in his good time and according to his just judgment. And so it will be with all of the enemies that rise up against the church of Jesus Christ in time. Jehovah God, in his jealousy and with perfect vengeance, will bring about their destruction. They will fill the cup of wrath and then they will bring about their end. As complete as the destruction is, so glorious is the salvation of God's church and God's people. The destruction of sin and the destruction of sinners is set forth as that in which God's children are able to see their salvation and their deliverance. Just as Noah and his family saw the destruction of the world that then was and were able to see in that God's care for them and God's salvation of His church. So we, in the destruction of the wicked, are able to see the salvation of Jehovah God with regard to His own. Jesus is coming again. And Jesus is coming in order to bring about the final end of all things. He's coming in order to vindicate the name of God in order that God be glorified in and through the wicked as well as the righteous. And He will unleash the fullness of His wrath against the wicked and all of the enemies of God in order that that vengeance be realized decisively. But God does so for the sake of His church, for the sake of His remnant. He does so in order to deliver His church. And that we see also marvelously set forth here in the book of Nahum. Verse 7, In the midst of all this devastation and destruction, the Lord is good. 
a stronghold in the day of trouble, and he knoweth them that trust in him. All of a sudden, these words appear in the midst of terrible threatening and judgments and devastation. They come unexpected as a ray of light in the midst of the darkness. Who can stand before the wrath and the anger of Jehovah God? And then suddenly God issues this marvelous word. The Lord, Jehovah, is good, a stronghold in the day of trouble, and He knoweth them that trust in Him. God is good. He's a God of covenant faithfulness. He will keep covenant with those whom He has chosen from all eternity and in whom He has given the gift of faith. And He knows them that trust Him. They are His own. He's given them that faith by which they lay hold on Him and by which they declare repentance, the forgiveness of sins, and their hope in Jesus Christ. Beloved, when you behold the fury and the anger of Jehovah God, as we see it in the storms, and as we see it displayed in the Scriptures upon the wicked, we don't panic. We don't despair. We trust Jehovah's goodness. And we believe this. Because He is good, He must be the avenger of evil. His goodness demands that sin be punished. God repeats these judgments again and again in order to impress upon Israel this truth. I have not forgotten you. I have not forsaken you. I have not forgotten to be kind. And beloved, as the end gets closer, we, as the church of Jesus Christ, cling to God's word and to those expressions. Easy it would have been for Israel to forget that God was kind. They might have thought, all the nations are against us. Where is our God? He claimed that He would keep covenant with us, but look at how mighty they are. They brought us into captivity. There's no evidence of His faithfulness anywhere around. It seems as though we're all going to be destroyed in the midst of this life. God gives Nahum a clear, decisive message in order to set forth the reality of the love of God for His church, and for His people. God has not forgotten His own. All the enemies will be destroyed. But Jehovah God is bound to His people by His covenant faithfulness. To hate Israel is to hate God. To hate the church is to hate Jehovah God. And the powerful, glorious God who uses such decisive language with regard to to Nineveh, is the same God who will preserve and keep His people in safety to all eternity. He is a refuge, a stronghold for His people. What a beautiful picture here. In the midst of the persecution and the affliction and the struggles of this life, we have in Jehovah a stronghold, a high tower. He is that refuge over against everything that's changing and everything that's in flux, we have that which is sure, that which is stable, and that which never changes. Turmoil in the air, turmoil on land, turmoil in the sea. And we have Jehovah as a stronghold. The only shelter that's able to face and withstand all of the devastation and all of the powers that be. And He will maintain His righteousness in Jesus Christ who is that stronghold. It's ultimately in Christ that we find that refuge. In Him, we are safe. The name Nahum, as we mentioned, means consolation or comfort. Nahum's message throughout is devoted to comfort the people of God. It's a message of judgment, a message of devastation, destruction upon a heathen city. It's a book, however, that's intended to comfort God's people. And every chapter advances the certainty, the inevitability of God's awesome judgment. But in that message also, it advances hope. The burden of Nineveh is the salvation of God's people. It's their comfort. God is good. He will destroy all of the enemies that confront Him and His church. 
And He will vindicate His name and His own glory. And He will take His people and He will bring them to the glory that awaits. Jehovah is good, a stronghold in the day of trouble. He knoweth them that trust in Him. He's not good in the sense that wicked men imagine that He overlooks sin, that He will just love the wicked and the righteous alike. His love is tied to His holiness, His righteousness. It's purer than snow. He is in Himself perfect, without any evil. And that goodness is unchangeable. There's no shadow of turning, no variableness in Him. And in that goodness, He loves His children, and He loves His church. He draws His church to Himself by His irresistible power and goodness. He draws them into fellowship with a living Christ as their Savior and their Lord. And He gives us to know that in Jesus Christ, our sins have been forgiven. Justice has been realized. His vengeance has been executed. And therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are found in Him. When the storms of trouble rage, Jehovah and His goodness are the comfort of the people of God. In Him, we find our shelter and our hope. He knows them that trust in Him. He knows them with a knowledge of love. He knows them in distinction from the ungodly upon whom He pours the fury of His wrath. He knows them in their needs and in their troubles and in their weaknesses and in their fears. He knows them as those who are His own, in whom He has placed the gift of faith. And the power of that knowledge is that it makes us, it moves us to love Him and to trust in Him, to cry out to Him and to cling to Him as our only comfort and our only hope. We find blessed assurance in His marvelous love and in His goodness. And we know the firm trust in His faithfulness. And looking to Calvary, we know That marvelous love. A love so great that His wrath was poured out upon His own Son. Beloved, as we examine ourselves and as we see our sin and our sinfulness, and as we know the vengeance and the jealousy of our God, we cling to the cross in whom we find our hope and our joy. Our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Our Father who art in heaven, we thank Thee for Thy goodness and for Thy mercy in Jesus Christ. We are not deserving of that comfort and that hope. We deserve with the wicked to be cast off and destroyed eternally. We thank Thee for Thy grace in moving us to repentance, causing us to see our sin, to cry out for mercy, and to lay hold upon our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and His perfect sacrifice. May we come to the table of the Lord next Sunday, confessing that it is nothing of ourselves, but all of Him. And may we show our love for Thee and our delight in the things of Thy kingdom as we cling to Christ and we know in Him salvation and hope. We pray this for Jesus' sake. Amen.